Hello and welcome back to the Golf Ireland podcast. Uh, I am your host, Stephen Murphy. I'm here with my co-host, Valerie Wheeler. Valerie, thank you as always for joining me here on the Golf Ireland pod. We're back for episode two. Uh, how are you? Great, a flying it. Delighted now to be getting into the swing of things. The pod's out last week, some lovely feedback from everyone about it. So it's nice now to keep going and, you know, obviously present the best podcast we can present. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And how was your weekend? Busy, I'm sure, as always, with yourself. Good, yeah, of course. Jay has taken over my life. We're still in the middle of the league, and that's me. And I actually spent a lot of the weekend watching the World Indoor Athletic Championships, and oh my God, I am so amazed by the talent we have in Irish. The women were out there flying that flag for us. I'm delighted for them all. I was just going to say, I found myself watching it as well, actually. And it's athletics is one of those things where you can just sort of tune in, and you know, it's basically start here, first person to finish here wins. There's no like, you know, you don't have to get too deep in the weeds. Uh, but I'm still thinking they're missing out on a trick. There should be someone like me running in the same race just to show <laughs> how fast these people are. I think that would be a huge asset to uh, World Athletics. So I don't know if you have any connections there, Valerie, but you can uh, yeah. put a word in. But uh, uh, um, brilliant, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, well done to the girls, of course, in the relay lace and um, Sarah Lavin as well. Like, as you mentioned, how fast they're running. She was in the 60 meter hurdle. And like when they slow down the footage afterwards, it's just... Just seeing how they win by literally a millimetre per second, it's it's absolutely amazing. Fair play to them all. Yeah, I think she lost by three tenths of a second and she finished fifth. And it's like, what? That's just yeah, it, your your brain can't really comprehend that. And then they hit the big they hit the big foam wall at the end of the wall. I know. <laughs> I can't I tell know. that I injured themselves. It's got uh, them so yeah, they're in such speed. Yeah, fabric. Yeah. Really nice, relaxing. Tell us about yours. You yes. were taking something off the bucket list. Go on, tell us about Karen. You didn't get blown away in so, here. No, Saturday we were close. Uh, yeah, so we drove up Saturday morning to Balmullis to Karen, myself, and my mate Sam. Um, and we've wanted to play this course for a couple of years, as I said last week. So, yeah, we got playing Saturday on the Hackett course. And then Sunday we played the Wild Atlantic Dunes course. And it was great because Saturday was the tough day weather wise. The, the winds were up, I think, 50 miles an hour gusts. It was crazy. I don't think a, I don't think a competition would have been held there that day. I think the balls were kind of moving, but uh it was a bit of a laugh for us. We had a we had a great crack. And then Sunday was uh, genuinely I think because Saturday was so windy when we had the camera this Sunday, it was just yeah, you know, we were so appreciative of it. Uh and it was still quiet enough where we had the course pretty much to ourselves. And that Wild Atlantic Dunes nine holes is just stunning. Um I I, I words can't do it justice and even pictures can't because I've seen videos of the place and I've seen my pictures that I talk of it and you just can't get a scope of the, the the elevation changes are just incredible. But like I couldn't speak more highly of the the service. Uh, Jerry there, I know he's general manager. Uh, Olivia behind the desk at the pro shop was great crack. They're just normal people that have this incredible golf course that, you know, people all over the world want to come and play. So couldn't speak more highly of it and hopefully get back at some stage next year as well. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um... So sound, they actually are really sound. Although maybe myself and yourself could head down there and play sometime. Although I don't know, would you like to be out there playing at me now? I'd be slowing things down a I lot. I love it. No, I love it. Look, at, if you're going to have a five hour round anywhere, you might as well have it there with the with the views and stuff. So, no, absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on to We'll get on to Jerry uh, and see what we can <laughs> organize. Uh, we'll get into some uh, tidbits of news, uh, Valerie, as well. We want to give a shout out to Garrett McNeely. Uh, massive congratulations to him. He's finished his tenure as team captain of Disability Golf with Golf Ireland. Uh, an amazing term as captain. I think anyone will let you know the great work that he did. Um, and Disability Golf has come on leaps and bounds in the last couple of years. And that definitely has uh, been down to a lot of the work that Garrett has done. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to him um, for his um, amazing work. Um, and also want to give a shout out to Sarah Byrne uh, this week as well, Valerie. An amazing, amazing run of form she's on. Ah, look, she's absolutely unbelievable. Um, she's after getting herself an Annika Award on the watch list for that. Um, she's out in the University of Miami, um, out there in the sun, enjoying life, enjoying golf, and she is putting a dominant performance in the golf course. Of course, she had two individual victories and five top 10 finishes, earning Golfer of the Month honours twice. So anytime that I'm online, I see see her picture pop up, something's popping up, she's always doing something, she's always, you know, she's unbelievable at the moment. Yeah, oh, she's she's always leading her team as well. She's just been in a rich vein of form as well. And as like you, I've noticed as well, she's always in a short sleeve t-shirt. Uh, looks like she's got sun cream on because she's always in the sun. And I am very, very jealous of, of that. But, uh, you know, she's on a rich vein of form and she's got, I know she's a title to, this year to defend out uh, in Connemara. 
So uh, she'll be looking to defend that too. And um, look, at, I, would, I wouldn't be betting against her, uh, the form she's in, Valerie. Uh, Valerie, we'll talk about our upcoming interviews. Who do you have on this week? Who will you be chatting to? This week, I have an author, Peter Gaffney, who is after writing a children's book, a golf children's book, which is really nice because we don't see many of them out there, right? It's called Billy and Tilly's Great Golf Game. This guy is so interesting. He's met Tiger Woods. He's played in the same tournament as Rory McIlroy. Like, this guy, you do not want to miss Peter's interview. No, definitely. I'm very, very interested uh, in listening to that as well. And I'll be chatting to David Shield, uh, a former guest as well from last year, uh, who's only back from Spain uh, playing golf over there. Um, so I'll be chatting to him about his uh, season uh, upcoming as well. So two great interviews coming up. Um, all right, right, we'll throw it to my conversation with David Shield. David Shield now joins me here on the Golf Ireland pod, back from uh, his first appearance last year. We got him back on as well. We had to uh, how great his episode was last season we really enjoyed it and I know it got a lot of great feedback David so thanks for, for joining me here again how, how have you been? Thanks Stephen yeah all good uh, hectic very busy wouldn't call uh, call it any sort of off season anyway so uh, that's been great yeah you've been filling me in there before we started recording yeah d- definitely not an off season I think your off season might be June, July and August uh, how, <laughs> compared to how busy your winter's been uh, yeah. yeah talk us through a little bit I was gonna my one of my questions was like you know have you been you know relaxing over the winter I, I know you wouldn't have been speaking because uh, uh, our conversation last year you know it was very clear you worked very hard in your game but you've been a very very busy bee over the last couple of months yeah been a, a very hectic couple of months. I think at the end of the season last year, after the North, I think that was mid September or something like that. I decided then that I was going to take a couple of weeks off. I gave the Irish mid am a miss, for example, and uh, and then I got yeah you know, got the call or whatever that I'd been picked to go to Argentina, Italia Cup in October. I was over in India for a work thing. So I got back from India straight to Argentina um, with Shane. That was brilliant. Really, really good two weeks, two great tournaments, uh, really well organized. We get hosted by the families there. and Some really good players as well playing in that. Um, Luis from Spain won the uh, Italia Cup and then he won the Portuguese Am a couple of weeks ago and he finished runner up last week in Spain. Uh, a couple of really good South Africans who did really well in the South Africa trip that we were on as well. So that was cool. Two weeks, got back from that. And then I said, right, I'm going to take a few weeks off now. And then I had thrown my name in the hat for the South Beach Jam in Miami and I got into that. So then I said, right, now I need to get back practicing and go to that. So I played that in the Florida, I think it was called, in um, over Christmas. And then I got back for a couple of weeks and then... I picked for the octagonal matches in uh, Costa Belena in Spain. So I went down to that and then it was straight to South Africa, myself and Jack Hearn for three weeks, back for four days and then over to the Spanish Ham, which I was fortunate to get into as well. So yeah, it's been a very, very exciting couple of months, to be honest. It's amazing to play <clears throat> so many cool tournaments and get so many opportunities through, I guess, the the High Performance Panel and Fuck Golf Ireland are, are helping us with. So it's been a really, really cool few months, difficult to manage with with uh, work and everything like that. But, you know, it could be once in a lifetime or, you know, a couple of times in a lifetime opportunity, so. Just thinking of the the air miles must be just incredible. Uh, I have I have you sat got... down and jotted down like how many? <laughs> no, no, and I didn't really think to sign up for any programs either, which is probably, uh, <laughs> probably a miss, but you might see yeah. retrospectively. I've definitely been on a few Lufthansa planes, so see if they can sort nice. me out a few points or something. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Um, those those events obviously are quite different to the the events that you will be playing in the upcoming months, where it's just mainly yeah. Irish kind of golfers. How do they compare? Is is it a is it a treat almost to go out and put put yourself against the world's best, not just Irish's best? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, uh, even just the experience on the different grasses and different types of courses, like a lot of grain in Argentina, loads of grain in America and Florida. I played a little bit on grain in, in kind of the off season when the, the grass is a little bit dormant in Spain before, but playing in some of those tournaments, like particularly in America with the grainy, uh, you know, run-ins to the greens and everything like that. It's a really, really cool experience. Played with some great players, like I mentioned in Argentina, one of whom just lost the playoff a couple of weeks ago in the African Am in Leopard Creek to get a spot in the Open. Um, so, yeah, got some really good experiences in America. I played with a couple of really good players in practice rounds, like Chris Kim from England, who played on the Junior Ryder Cup with Sean, played with Matt Edgar, who's pretty fifth in the world or something like that, got a great chance of qualifying for the PGA Tour off the, the college system now in America. 
so yeah, it's been a really great experience to, to see some of them in action. Like Matt's outdrove me by 46 yards comfortably on the second hole of the day. <laughs> so that kind of thing is is cool to see. South African guys are bombers as well. When you're down there, they just hit the ball differently. I guess they're ingrained to hitting it really hard and really far. Um, so yeah, it's been brilliant. And then the octagonal matches was particular highlight the, the week we had there. Um in Costa Blena with a few days prep and good practice um, with uh, with Mick and Stephen, who's the Mick, the coach of our men's high performance team. Stephen, the coach, the the boys' high performance squad, because we had a mixed team, three from each. Um, so it was a brilliant week as well. That's actually a, a question that just popped up to my head there. Like, are you seeing now, especially with the the younger guys coming into these events, the, uh, is the speed just getting up there with every gen, kind of generation? Like. You see now on the PGA Tour, I think it was Jake Knapp with the most comfortable looking, mm. relaxed, and 192 mile an hour ball speed. It just seems uh, mind boggling. But are you seeing that so, now with all these younger guys coming in? Are they all bombers off the tee? Yeah, I think predominantly, um, which is really cool to see because that's not really my game. I hit it medium, medium, maybe shorter side of medium, but we'll give myself medium. Um, and I hit it kind of low, so I'm definitely not a big launcher. So it is really cool to see these guys in action. Um, obviously, it's particularly enjoyable for me when I see these bombers in action and it goes everywhere, because then when you can see the control game versus that. But, I mean, it is really cool to see the ones who, who get up and rip it and then uh, keep it really well in control and just want to hit driver everywhere, looking for a really good reason not to. Um so it is cool to see that because, again, like at my age, that's not going to end up being my game. I could work on speed, but I think keeping my focus on reducing the volatility and relying on a good short game, that kind of thing. Um, but it is cool to see it in action because it's it's got to be the future, yeah. Definitely. Um, you said you're only back from Spain playing there uh, last week. Uh, tied yeah. 50 for the week, a disrupted sort of uh, tournament with challenging weather. Uh, mm. How do you reflect upon that week? Um, yeah, disappointing. It was a course that I had um, I had practiced at a little bit during um, lockdown and COVID. I was over there with my best friends, lives in New York. So I knew the course. It's a really, really good course. It's a really difficult course. They get the challenge tour finals there quite frequently. And the scoring is always really poor, like level par for four rounds is getting you a top six kind of thing. So it's a really difficult course. So really fancy match play there. So that was the big disappointment was that it didn't go top 64 in match play. Um, we just had bad rain a couple of the mornings that delayed it. It's already a tight enough turnaround with daylight. So they had to reduce the 72 holes stroke play, ball stroke play. Um, so I got through the cut pretty okay. Played okay the first two days. I was a couple over both rounds and uh, made the cut. I thought I had a good chance of pressing on then and started both the third and fourth round reasonably well in front lines in around level par, but as I turned then, I just let shots go away, which was disappointing. Um, so how do I reflect on it? Happy to make the cut. I played the Spanish Am three years ago and I finished pretty much dead last. So that was pretty cool to play that for my second time and then reasonably comfortably make the cut because it's a really good field. Some really, really good players, really high ranking players in that. Um, and then disappointed didn't get the run of the match play. That was the big thing. I would have loved to run a match play on that course because once you're, once you're in the cut, you never know, as we've seen in Ireland over the last number of years. So... Um, but good again good learning experience good preparation for the west now really with kind of bad weather and high winds so it's it's very different to play bad weather and high winds in that kind of course where you've got ob and hazards everywhere as opposed to when we play in the west of course we've got the cabbage to the sides of some of the holes and the odd hazard but it's very different because it's designed for windy type of golf um but so it's good yeah getting the ball flight down a bit um very enjoyable week to be honest Brilliant. And I know we're in the first week of uh, Mar of March here uh, in Ireland. Uh, looking ahead now to the busy season of the Irish golf calendar, uh, any any events in particular that has you uh, very excited? Um, no, I'm really looking forward to getting back on Lynx. Um, I mean, I haven't played Lynx since the North. Are we, I played the Hillary Society in December um, in Port um Port Marnock Lynx, as it was called, James and Lynx now. Um, but looking forward to getting back on Lynx uh, absolutely, it was then in the scrum when I was back. Um, so really looking forward to basically all of the links ones in particular. The closest on in Dunleary this year, which is very close to my home as well, of course, that I know well. So that'd be great. They were a great host for the 
All Ireland uh, Barton Shield and Senior Cup finals last year, and um, so I'd expect that place to be in top shape as well. I think they'll, I think they'll do a really good job. So looking forward to that again. Sleeping in my own bed. The Irish Am is in Rosses this year, which is great. I mean, I again with my with my uh, situation connection and it's growing. My dad been there. I've got my I've got a lot of my tournaments this year. I'll be sleeping in my own bed, which is great because I get the two the two runs around Rosses where I be at home and then it's grown. And then we've got the East and then the close being the Leary means I'll be at home home here for those two. So uh, yeah, really I think looking forward to the the main the the four provincials. Um, the Irish Am Rosses and the close in, in Dunleary. Beware arrested David Shiel, I think is the is the the <laughs> a well slept rested David Shiel. Uh, get more of that. Yeah, you won the Bridgestone Player of the Year last year uh, in the men's division. Um, has that given you a bit of extra confidence going into this year? Just knowing that you had such a, a stellar year last year to win that award, that you know you can go and and, and push on from that. Yeah, I think it certainly does. I mean. It's such a momentum sport as well, and you see that all the time. Of when you're, when you're a little bit more confident in your own ability and your own control of the ball, that definitely helps. Um, so I think last season when I look back at it, I mean, I'm I'm just over the moon with with how it went. Yeah, I would have loved to have won one of the tournaments for sure, but to see the consistency and and what I got and. Uh, since we last spoke, even just getting the hands on the trophy was really cool. It was just just a, a nice nice feeling after all the work and the length of the season that goes into it to get the trophy and see the names um, like the Rory and Darren Clark and the Harrington and even some of the great you know uh, Irish players that we would know of. Um, on that was was really cool. Um, so it certainly gives confidence for this year and. Um, a real focus to try and push on and, and be be aggressive in the tournaments. And I know I have the kind of track record now, if you want, last year, I've been able to do the consistent scoring and make the cuts. Um, so, yeah, it definitely definitely helps with the focus of, of trying to get even higher up those leaderboards, get into the final stages of the match plays and, um, and take it from there, like the South, and get into the quarterfinals, being there on the penultimate day and... And um, been right in the heat of it was, was a great experience as well. So looking forward to it for sure. Brilliant. And finally, David, you're also busy outside of golf. Uh, you, you have your own business as well uh, to keep you busy. Um, yeah. Do you want to give us a quick kind of a recap of what exactly that business is and how it's going? Yeah, I mean, it's going, going great. It's been a very, <clears throat> very, very busy two year, two and a bit years for us since we set up. Um, we started out with the consulting in the financial services space where we provide basically advisory services and anything to do with analytics and, and data um, or modeling, particularly in the risk space for the banks. And we worked with insurance companies and fintechs. And, and then since we ventured into that, we started building our own products too. And we spotted this opportunity that I mentioned last year in the home energy space. And, and we built a whole set of products that surround home retrofitting and making use of the national BER database as a we're a trusted partner of the SEAI, which gives us access to that and to their calculation mechanisms. So we've built a whole bunch of technology now to serve the, <clears throat> the homeowners and we have our public facing your retrofit.ie site where you can come on and find out what you could do to your house. If you don't have a BER rating, we'll estimate it for you with a couple of questions. And we'll give you a bit of a steer of who can help you on that journey of, of trying to save on your bills or save on the overall outgoing costs of, of running the house from an energy perspective and also making it more comfortable and doing your bit for the, the fight against climate change, let's say. And then we've built a number of products to serve the market and the, the companies who are helping you to, to retrofit. And we've got big partnerships with the likes of Chadwick's, Electric Ireland, FBE from an insurance perspective. We're live on my home now, actually, which is a really cool feature to see. So on all the property ads that my home have on their side for rental or purchase, they have a little uh, inlet called the My Green Estimate, which is powered by our, our software, where we'll tell you what the potential BUR of the house is, how much the running costs would be, and then it brings you in a link directly to our site so you can actually view the house. If you're looking to buy a house or rent a house, we can give you a real sense as what the energy performance or potential energy performance of it is. So, yeah, we've got some really cool partners in that space, and uh, it's all been totally new for us, but exciting in that regard, which, and that led us to India. We were part of an accelerator program that the ESB and the Electric Ireland team had put us into. 
where we're competing against startups across the world who have energy ideas, pitching to big energy companies from Australia and and uh, Asia and India and America and, and showing them our ideas and how we potentially work with them. So it's, yeah, it's certainly been a very exciting period for us. And I have a brilliant team there that's so, so capable, so intelligent. They've been brilliant as well with, with me, obviously having a lot going on with the golf. They've been driving things forward and leading out with the clients and, um, and building a whole set of technology and a whole business model as well for our consulting consulting work, which is which is really taking off, which is great because we're in the mix competing with the big four traditional KPMGs and EYs and, and these kind of companies um, for the work. And we're getting a lot of faith and trust placed in us um, to be uh, trusted advisors for the big financial institutions as well as just the big four. So it's been a very exciting couple of years. Yeah. Brilliant. Glad to hear it's going so well. Congratulations on that front as well. Um, David, thank you so much for your time. We wish you best of luck for the rest of the season as well. And it was good talking to you. Thanks very much, Stephen. So joining me on the Golf Ireland podcast this week is Peter Gaffney, author. Peter, first of all, welcome to the pod. Hi, Valerie. Thanks for having me. Peter, it's really nice to have you because this is something different this week that we're going to get into and maybe talk about in a little while about why you're on. But you know, this is the Golf Ireland podcast. Can you first tell me about your, your golf and when did you first start playing? Uh, I first came across golf. I would have been, it would have been about 93 and the Ryder Cup in Belfry was my first uh, exposure to golf as my granddad insisted on having it on the TV. So I had to turn off the cartoons. Um, and then that definitely got me interested in around about 11, 12, I found myself um, playing in Mallow Golf Club uh, with my friend Brian. And that was kind of, you know, Sky Sports was just coming out and Tiger was just getting going. This was around 96, 97. So every young fella just wanted to be Tiger. And, and, and they had this massive interest in the game. Um, I actually met Tiger, actually, then when I was 14, when he was pra- uh, practicing um, down in Kerry for the British Open. Um, so I was very, very lucky to have met him. And uh, yeah, I was very, very um, big golf fan in my teens. Got on the Fred Daly team in Mallow, eventually at the age of 18. Um, for a few weeks and managed to play in the Kerry boys as well when I got down to 10 and I'm pretty sure Rory was there so I think you could say technically I've competed against Rory but <laughs> <laughs> I I uh I missed the cut anyway so I was sent home on the first day I'm sure Rory made the cut because all, all the talk was about this 12 year old from Northern Ireland who was, who was unbelievable I was 18 he was 12 and he he made the cut and I missed it <laughs> um and then, uh, yeah, I, I remember actually I volunteered in the Irish Open um, with Mallow Golf Club. So I was able to go inside the ropes a few times at 17, 18 as a steward. And um, I ended up caddying then in the old Hedekin Sale for a few summers as well when I was in college. So I've had a long history with the game, um, kind of a, li- a lifelong love affair, if you will. Yeah, and to be fair, look at the role models you had when you first got into the game. Like, there's so many of them nowadays, and there's so many shows like Netflix, and you know, people are getting to see these um, golfers more and more. But you mentioned meeting Tiger there. What was your experience like meeting him? Was it a quick hello? How are you? Was there words exchanged? Uh, it was just kind of a quick picture. Yeah, he was. Uh, it was fairly informal. You know, you got to walk the course when in Waterville when they were practicing for the British Open. Um, and he was very friendly and approachable. Um, um, so yeah, there was Payne Stewart, Tiger, Marco, Marco Mara. So that was really cool. Uh, yeah, everyone got a picture and kind of got to see him up close. And you know, you, you really understand how good they are when you see them up close. And the ball just comes off just differently. It comes off so low and so fast that you know you know <laughs> you know you know how good they are very quickly. There'd be plenty of people listening to this extremely jealous of you know Peter that you got a chance to meet Tiger, of course. Um, so that is your <laughs> yeah. history, and that is where your love of golf began. Did you play other sports, actually, Peter, being from Mallow? Uh, I played a bit of rugby. Um, it was mainly rugby and golf for me. Um, golf was kind of probably the one I was better at, so that really kind of took over my summers. You know, as a teenager, there's nothing better than kind of being 14 and just spending the whole summer um, just walking the course and trying to get better, you know what I mean? And I was lucky. There was loads of really good players around Mallow at the time. Uh, all kind of single figure so plenty of fellas to be trying to uh, aspire to to be like amazing amazing and then of course your love of golf probably pushed on in life and the book came about which we will get into it's called billy and tilly's great golf game first of all tell us how the book came about 
Well, basically, it would have been around um, kind of October, November 2020. And uh, there was a bit going on. I got laid off with the lockdowns uh, thanks to COVID. Um, and we just found out that baby number two was on the way. So we decided that I'd be a stay at home dad. And kind of, you know, I kind of think around this time, you know, um, like everyone I was kind of watching the TV, you know, kind of wondering what I'd done with my time and watching 10,000 hours of golf, you know, there's nothing else to do. So watching endless amounts of golf. And at this time in golf, um, there was all this talk around speed training, putting on muscle and hitting the ball as far as you can, kind of find it and then hit it onto the green. And, and some of the uh, shorter hitting pros kind of came out saying, there's less skill involved in getting more muscle and more skill involved in finding the fairway, shaping the ball to the hole. And that kind of resonated with me. So I kind of thought, wouldn't it be funny if there was some sort of animal character that was cartoon character that was kind of hitting it big, working out, hitting it all over the place. And that was the kind of start of it. And then, I, you know, I, I, as I said, I was a stay at home dad. So I thought, why don't I make a children's book out of it? And then the more I kind of thought about it, I thought, you know, this fellow's going to have to play a few holes. He's going to need a playing partner. Um, so there's going to have to be two animals. So what animals could play golf together? And I thought of the story of the tortoise and the hare, you know, the race between the classic race between the two of them. And kind of that's, you know, the more I looked at it, it was just perfect for my story because the Billy Bunny is hitting it big and he's working out and he's a bit wayward. And Tilly Turtle is hitting it straight, finding the fairway, has a plan. Um, so the story kind of wrote itself once I kind of had that spine of it um, and it's kind of having said that now the first draft Valerie was pretty bad in terms of it was I had to ungolf it it was all you know eight irons to the dog leg uh, pitching wedge uh, <laughs> and you, when you're thinking about kind of three to five year olds you know you had to had to kind of ungolf it a bit um, but then we had the lovely idea of adding some animals in um, on each hole so there's the bunkers there's the trees there's the water and there's there's an animal waiting there for Billy on every hole uh, when he gets into trouble, unlike Tilly Turtle, who stays on the short grass and has a plan. Um, so it kind of wrote itself once I had those two characters and was able to kind of take the hair of the tortoise and apply it across um, to, 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 to my book. Um, and then kind of, you know, once I felt it was good enough to share, um, kind of just decided to kind of put myself kind of out there and do it, then I just had to find an illustrator. Um, which is which is kind of funny because my mom was playing golf with a retired guard and his son is the illustrator. Um, so over the over the the course of the round, they got talking about the book, and PJ said to my mom, "Sure, why doesn't Connor do it?" And by the next day, we were connected again on WhatsApp. Um, we were really good childhood friends at the age of seven, and then had reconnected um, straight away. And sure, by that by by the next day, he'd agreed to do the book. So. It was uh, it was cool that golf had kind of brought us together. Look, it's really nice. And I think it's such a nice idea behind it, because if you want to get children interested in golf, you know, there probably isn't many books out there about golf for children that are illustrated that are nice. The pictures would attract kids to it. You know, it's not like, as you said, you needed to de-golf it a bit. And I think these are important because you you get more kids into it and more interest, I feel, with books like yours. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the reasons I kind of kept going with it because I wasn't sure if I was going to put it out there. But it's not often that you have an idea and you find something, and there actually is a gap in the market. And there, when I looked at it, there was there was only one other children's book for golf, so that was enough of a reason to keep going with it. And as you say, you know, across the board for golf, accessibility for children and kind of getting them interested in it is a, it's definitely room for improvement across the board there. So. Um, yeah, as I said, once we took out the, the golfing terms like dog, leg, gator, and, it, and we added in some animals, it became way more accessible for them. And yeah, it's just that we feel that it's a nice introduction to the game um, for children. And it's a way for, for you know, perhaps um, grandparents to, to kind of share their hobby because, you know, it's a hobby that they would still be doing later in life. And um, the little ones, they always want to know. They'll never say no to sitting on your knee and reading a story. So, so it's a way for us to share our hobbies and just get them interested in it and just get them just get them picking up a club and swinging because you can't you can't tell them to grip the club or do anything like that they won't listen you just want to get them interested and let them off and is there more books going to come down the line uh yeah yeah we've we've written a, we've written a second one um uh, so connor is kind of illustrating uh, the books going forward for me and we're working on a second Billy and Tilly as well. So there's, there's going to be a sequel to Billy and Tilly. They're, 
um, which we will hopefully release next year, um, golf based as well. So yeah, there's more coming. And uh, yeah, you know, we're basically, we've kind of, uh, we released this in October in, in locally in Mallow and on Amazon. And we've kind of reached the phase now where we're happy to take it a bit further and, and try and get it nationwide. So that's the kind of next step for us now. And where can people purchase it? So uh, it's, it's available on, on Amazon at the moment. Um, basically, globally, it just depends which store you're on on Amazon for delivery. And it's also available in Mano in the bookshops, Philips, Eaton's and Katie's. And you can buy it on Philips website and get it shipped anywhere. And then, yeah, the next step for us is to is to get it nationwide. So that's kind of the next part of the, the next hurdle to overcome. You know, we're, as I said, we're, we're kind of only started this a few months back. So we're, we're just kind of learning on the job as well. Yeah, no, a lovely journey and a really nice gift for people out there, especially if golf is in your family and you want to get your kids into it. Billy and Tilly's great golf name is the book. Before I let you go, Peter, um, you did mention that you were a stay-at-home dad for a while. Are you still a stay-at-home dad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kaylin is now five, but Brody is still two. So um, he's still kind of, he'll be coming in the door there in a while now. So uh, yeah, he's kind of gone from nine to 12. So I have a little bit of free time, which allowed me to actually get the book over the line because found it very hard with no sleep to kind of get things done um but yeah so still a stay at home dad and then once Brody starts back in school full time we'll we'll see what we'll see what's next then because it's very rare for to have a stay at home dad now and I think it's really nice to see that there is dads that are willing to stay at home with their kids as well I must say I don't know anyone else that I'd say you're the first person I met to be a stay at home dad Peter for being totally honest <laughs> with you <laughs> yeah I definitely I'm definitely one of the only ones pushing the pram around the place but um you know, there's, it was just, it was, I wanted a career change. So he kind of bought, I was lucky, you know, bought me some time and, you know, um, it was just a nice thing for like, um, that my wife was able to allow me to do it. Yeah. And, um, you never get the time back, you know what I mean? And they want to hang out with you when they're kind of three to five and then they tell you to get lost when they're a bit older. So, you know, while, while I'm popular, I may as well, I may as well be there. Right. Um, but actually, look, here's the, I brought the, um, here's the cover of the book so people can see it there. That's what it looks like. Stunning. Billy and Tilly's yeah. book. Peter, honestly, thank you so much for coming on. I wish you the very best look at the books going forward. And we'll definitely keep an eye out for the next Billy and Tilly's game. Um, great golf game book. All right. Okay. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks for Thanks having me on. Much. Now, we hope you enjoyed those two interviews. I have some uh, some news and some updates uh, to go through as well just before we wrap up. Uh, we'll start with the Spanish Am. Uh, as we mentioned, we were chatting to David Shield about it. Uh, we had some great results here in the men's and women's. Sean Keeling in the men's had a superb fourth place finish. Uh, so congratulations to him. Robert Brazel tied ninth, another great finish there. Ryan Griffin tied 14th. Hugh Foley tied 22nd. David Shield tied 50th. And then unfortunately, Paul Coughlin and Dunica Cleary missed the cut. In the women's then, again, some great results here. Annabelle Wilson got all the way to the semi-finals, uh, where unfortunately she lost. But a great week there for Annabelle. Uh, so congrats to her. Uh, Jessica Ross lost in the round of 32 in the match play. And Mairead Wilson lost in the round of 16 in the match play. So good results there for both Jessica and Mairead. Uh, and unfortunately, Olivia Costello and Marina Joyce Moreno missed the cut. Uh, but congrats to all involved there as well. Now, on the LPGA, we had Leona Maguire uh, finished tied 34th in the HSBC Women's World Championship. Uh, on the PGA Tour, Shane Lowry nearly had a, a win, a long-awaited win on the PGA Tour, but unfortunately came up just short, uh, tied 4th in the Cognizant Classic. Uh, Roy McIlroy back on tied 21st. Uh, in the DP World Tour, Tom McKibben finished tied 12th in the SDC Championship in South Africa. Richard O'Donovan from Selbridge came through the qualifier but missed the cut. Uh, and Tom McKibben now is playing the Johnson Workwear Open this week. So best of luck to Tom. Um, still no event in the LET. The next event will be the end of March in Australia. So keep an eye out for more details then. Um, it's the same on the Challenge Tour. The next events are the 14th to the 17th and the 21st and the 24th of March. The two weeks in India. Uh, and then finally on the Alps Tour, Robert Morin uh, will finish tied 7th in the last three events in Egypt. Um, next uh, Alps event will be early May in Italy. So best of luck to uh, Robert Moore in there as well. Uh, and that sums up uh, the podcast uh, for this week. Thank you once again for listening. And we'll be back next week uh, for another episode.